Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Today, we're going to be taking a look at this MSD Super Disk Drive. Well, yep, that, that's what it says. The box is upside down because the original owner just happened to open it that way. Uh, I picked this up a few years ago. I did a video called uh, Ozark Road Trip. I'll link to it below. Uh, real nice guy. I was able to pick this up and some other things from him, and I've been wanting to get to this ever since. Uh, we're going to take this apart and look at it before we try to use it because it has some known issues with leaking capacitors. So we'll want to get that taken care of first if that's a problem on this particular unit. And without further ado, let's get started. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They not only do PCBs and flex PCBs, they also have 3D printing service, injection molding service, they do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication. They also have a thriving maker community where you can share projects and check out what other people are doing. For your next project, head on over to PCB Way. Okay, uh, our box was made in December of 83. It says this is the SD1, it's a single drive. Uh, the housing called Hold Up to Two. I don't know if you can add a second one. It's got the serial number on the outside. Uh, inside is two user manuals. This one looks like a photocopy, and this one looks like maybe it's more original. Uh, a little yellow on the outside, but still very useful. And the original owner kept the packaging for almost everything, so we've got the original packaging for this guy. I'll slide him out. And we even have the original uh, serial cable and power cable. How about that? We're all set, ready to go. So let's get this set up on the bench so we can take it apart. So here we go, out of the box. It has the drive card in it. Keep the head from bouncing around. The metal case. And we look at the back. We have power, serial connection, serial connection, so in and out or out and in, whichever way you prefer to look at it. Power switch, a fuse, and an IEEE 488 connection. So if you have a, an adapter for your C64 that went in the user port, you can use that. Uh, perhaps you could even hook this to a pet which had that natively. I'll have to read the manual and a little vent on this side. Nothing here on the bottom. There is a label that says uh, it's the FCC type warning. So nice solid unit. Let's take it apart. Okay, let's take out these screws here. These are sheet metal type of screws. Oh, there we go. It was just stuck. Just had to hold your mouth at the right angle. Okay, what do we have inside? We have a Microsystems Development Inc. floppy disk drive. It has a number hand carved in here. One bodge wire, a zip tie. Nice, the classic 1980s crinkly surface to the board. As they ran it through a solder bath before they did the uh, solder mask. On this side, we have our TEC floppy. And we've got our control board over here. Uh, there are a couple chips missing here. And everything else seems to be populated. I'm trying to read the part number on the chips right beside it. Looks like M. 
Ow, I don't have my glasses on. Gosh. Okay, now with my old man specs on, it is M58725P. I have an inkling those are RAM chips. Right beside it is a couple other chips with labels. It says version 2.3, so I'm guessing those are ROM chips. So U1 and U2 are populated. U3 and U4 are not. I'm guessing that's for more RAM. U5 and U6 are the ROMs. And we've got lots of test points all over the board. That's nice. Only the ROMs are socketed. Uh, the construction looks pretty nice. Yep. Big chunky transformer on the back here. Okay. Well, let's get the circuit board out so we can look for leaking capacitors. Okay, I've been studying this here, and it looks like this front panel is kind of held on with some brackets here. Uh, the heat sink rail is held on down here along with the regulators. So the whole board must be held in from the bottom. And I think the disk drive is as well. And we need to unplug the disk drive. And looking at this chassis, yeah, there's no way two drives fit in there. It had to be a, a wider chassis for that. Okay, those are machine screws with star washers. And our cable isn't keyed. Pin one. Is also not marked on the board. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine. It's not marking cables or putting a polarity key in there. So I'll just put a stripe like this. Okay, now we've got our drive out of there. The machine is actually really clean inside. So we've got a good shot at our circuit board now. Um, 7805 regulator. I'm just curious, they've cut the center pin out, off and bent the two side pins out. And evidently they're just using the, the uh, tab as the third terminal, as they probably are on the 12 volt regulator here. That is an LAS1612. It's like the 12 volt regulators used in the 1541s. Oh, you know what? They did that because it was set up to take the metal can regulator and they just retrofitted to use a regular 7805. So we could, if we wanted to, uh, install the switching regulators in this guy and keep it cooler. Uh, I'll link to the video I did about those below. Do bet those are for RAM. This is an R1701-11. So I'm guessing this is the processor. And that looks like a Rockwell mark, so it's Surely a 6502 derivative, which would make sense. It's got the uh, 50 thousandths or 1.27 millimeter spacing, but staggered legs. Okay, and we've got an electrolytic here and here. And a couple big boys down there. So, let's get circuit board out of here now and like the drive it looks to be just a couple oh, screws here and these guys are tight and these are sheet metal screws just like the other cover screws oh and we've got um 
nuts here are screws of a sort on the that look like nuts on the yeah my triple 48 connector which we'll need to undo and we will do the universal nut driver just this one time no that weren't very tight anyhow there we go kind of has a funny little screw there and there is our circuit board it's interesting it looks like they made that for a plug right there but then just decided to solder this pigtail to the board and again with plugs not being marked perhaps there's only okay that is a keyed plug so there's only one way it can plug in all right and we have our circuit board loose so we have one two three electrolytics small ones at least and two larger ones um don't see any signs of leaking on these guys but uh, given the reputation i'll fire up the soldering iron and we'll pull one out to inspect it and check it and we'll also check these big guys just to make sure they're in good health okay got the soldering iron warmed up and Oh, I just noticed by this capacitor, there's a couple jumpers. I did find some schematics on Ray Carlson's site, which I'll link to below. Uh, very nice of him to make that available to everyone. And I guess this cap is the one I can not see as well on the board. So we'll pull it. Just gonna walk him out, heat up one leg, push it toward the other side. Just like that. A little back and forth and you'll get the part out, no muss, no fuss. And I did not check to see. Okay, the board is marked. Should have checked that ahead of time. Some boards, the mark might be hard to figure out or they might have failed to mark it or they might have marked it backwards this big trace here that was marked five volts so that's probably the positive side which it is all right go ahead and clear out those holes and you notice i left it on this big thick trace about twice as long it's because you got to heat up that trace and all the way through the board to get the solder out of there. Okay, I don't see any signs of leaking. It says a 16 volt 47 microfarad. No bulging. It did not smell of fish when it was desoldered. So maybe we got lucky and got one with good caps. Uh, I don't depend on this sort of tester for highly accurate results, but it's good enough to know if the part is working or if the part is bad. It's a good go, no go tester. Uh, 36 ohms, 58 microfarads, 36 ohms ESR. That seems a bit high. If you can hear snoring in the background, that's my dog. Twenty ohms that way. Hmm. Let me find a new capacitor and we'll compare them. Alrighty, we've got a new forty-seven microfarad sixteen volt capacitor. Test him. And yeah, right at 47 microfarads and 2 ohms. So 20 ohms or 50 ohms of the original was definitely way too high. So 
we'll go ahead and replace all three of these guys. Now I'm going to clip on these two big capacitors here, which I think are just the bulk filtering caps uh, for the 12 volt and 5 volt rails. And I think they're 470 microfarads. Or maybe 4700 would make more sense for a bulk cap. Yeah, 5000 microfarads, 0.1 ohms. These guys are probably both fine. Generally, it seems like the smaller caps uh, have the hardest life. Yeah, 0.03%. Uh, almost 4,900 microfarad, so these are fine. We'll replace the three small ones. Uh, they haven't leaked, but they're on their last leg. And uh, then we'll power this guy up and check our voltages. Okay, first things first, let's remove our other two caps. Usually for a normal trace like that, three to five seconds of heat up time. If you've got a big fat one like this, there's no thermal relief on the pad. Uh, you may be closer to 10 seconds. I've got the iron set to uh, 645 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 320-ish Celsius. Somewhere in there. Around 300 C. And where was the one on this end? I forgot already. It was right here. I think we're we'll hot to adjust our pin spacing a little bit here, or the lead spacing. These caps I had on hand are what I buy for Epson HX20s. Same value, just a little narrower lead pitch. But I can adjust it. Now you often find when you buy capacitors you'll get the same um, capacitor body but sometimes they'll be offered in different lead pitches and you know, they run them through a lead forming machine which does exactly what I'm doing here. It bends the legs out like that a little bit. And there are standard sizes that of uh, lead pitches that the insertion machines know how to deal with. The caps come in a paper tape, kind of those ammo belt type things you've seen, and the, it has fingers that pick up each lead like this. So it would be like, like that, and holds on. And if they are not, if the parts are not at the correct pitch, it'll spit them right out. It can't get a hold of them. Now, if it's a really common part, like a 0.1 microfarad, it will really ruin your day. Ask me how I know that. There we go. Okay, so... I've just kind of bent the legs out a little bit on these guys. I'm going to tack in one leg. Where was the third one? I need to put my glasses back on. Oh, it's so much better. Okay. Thing is, with my soldering glasses on, it's harder to see st stuff that's just a little bit further away. Now I'm pressing up from underneath as I'm reheating that leg I tacked on, and I just kind of get the capacitor into the right position. So they look like somebody knew what they were doing when they installed them, and they're not all dangly and gangly. There we go, just like that. Okay. And then we'll slobber up the other leg. As I'm watching this up close, I can see the solder start to flow out like this. If you've got a, a solder bead that is humped over like this, it's more of a ball. You didn't get it hot enough. When you get it hot enough, it'll flow out. It makes a nice fillet. There we go. 
Now we don't have to worry about the caps on this guy for another 40 years. And here's one cap. I'll just give that a little scrub. Pick up the flux we just put down there. And we're going to pick up the wet flux mess with the rag. You can't just smear the alcohol around there. You're just spreading the flux around if you do that. Looks like that chip may have been changed. I do believe it was. Okay, he's got... Uh, that looks like a decent hand soldering job on there. That is a 7404. The When you look at the top side... Oops, you can't see that. When you look at the top side of the board, it's going to be hard for you to tell. The heat hasn't flowed through the board enough on the top side on these other chips. The solders come all the way th uh, through, and it's got that nice fillet look I was talking about. And this one doesn't quite have that. So I'm just going to reflow each one of these for about five seconds. Oh, gosh, you guys couldn't see my soldering there, could you? I apologize. Yeah, you can kind of see the yellow coming through there. That was the flux left over on the board. That's not really going to hurt anything, but it looks a lot nicer if we clean it off there. Now, if you're working on test instrumentation, uh, there can be some very minute current leaks through the flux, which can cause problems. We have what we're talking in terms of nanoamps in that range. Not so much of a problem in this application, but it's a good habit to get in to clean up after yourself. Our chip is, looks a little nicer on this side now. And a little alcohol came through that hole. Huh. So this is our clock section. And it looks like they had maybe made that so they could put a metal can over it uh, for some RF purposes, but wound up not needing to do that. There is room for two other LEDs here, CR3 and CR4. Um, perhaps you use one of those or both for the dual disk drives. Kind of wonder how they did the cable here for the dual disk drives. Um, well, that was kind of like daisy chained between the drives. I've not seen a dual drive, so I don't know. And maybe sometime we'll come in and see if we can upgrade the RAM here. But I think for now, we'll just uh, try to get this running and see how it works. I just started inspecting the disk drive, and these little capacitors here have been leaking. Got some damage here, uh, quite a bit right through here. And these two over here don't look so bad. It looks like this unplugs, this unplugs. And there's one, two, three screws. And I don't know if this, this looks like a sensor here. That's probably just screwed into the circuit board. Not to something on the bottom. Okay, so I think we'll have to unplug this and pull these caps and see how much damage there is. Okay, I'm gonna mark the connectors. I like doing that to avoid problems later, or potential problems at least. These little spudgers come in handy for everything. A little safer than trying to use a screwdriver to get plugs unplugged. There we go. Okay. And that cable went through this little slot that's in the back of this arm. Alrighty. 
and we've got a big head on that screw and small heads on these two and a pot right here which might be for spindle speed I don't know there's a separate board here for the motor which I'm hoping does not have leaking caps I'm not sure how to take that guy out well let's start with what we know We've got a couple connectors here on this side. And luckily they have different numbers of pins. But I'm still going to mark them. That never hurts. There we go. Okay. Now can we, if we pull the drive card out, there's a piece of cardboard insulating the board there. Okay. But oh. It looks like I can see a hole here and there's a hole in the frame it's maybe under this plate yeah I can just see it in there maybe that's for drive speed that's rather inconvenient why would they put that plate like that because you can't get to it with a disc in there or anything running ah okay we've got an access hole on the back. That makes a lot more sense now. Oh, I'm still worried about leaking caps on this board. Um, what I'll do is make a map of where these capacitors are and what values they are. And then we'll take a look at, at Ray Carlson's documentation and notes to see if he says anything about the drive motor board. I took the board like this, made an outline, made a map where all the parts were, their part number on the board, and their values. I uh, then looked at the Ray Carlson's documentation and found out he had already done that. But anyhow, I've got a map here. And he does show that the spindle motor board also probably has some leaking caps. So we'll have to deal with those two, figure out how to get that apart. So on these guys, and luckily these are pretty common values that I think I should have on hand. Um, oh yeah, it's leaking all over the place. So first things first, put on old man glasses. Some wet electrolyte there. I'll go ahead and sop that up while I can. And capacitor legs on this one are like this. Sometimes you can't get these solder joints to reflow when the capacitor is leaked because the acid in the capacitor electrolyte alters the lead in tin. It forms a, an oxidation on the surface which has a higher melting temperature than the lead in tin. And if you get that stuff hot enough to melt, you have ruined the circuit board. So I'm going to carefully scrape the surface with a screwdriver. Sometimes that's enough. Try adding some new solder. And we'll see what happens here. See if that guy will come out. if it is or not well that leg moved not too sure about that one ok 
Okay. Uh, Probably stuck my head in the shot again. Next thing is the fiberglass brush. Polish up this whole area. Including the traces that were affected. back down the trace a little bit that stuff can wick under the solder mask and cause breaks further down the line all the stuff I'm scraping that you know is more than a centimeter away from the capacitor is corroded So this is the time-consuming part with these sort of repairs. It's just degunkifying everything and making sure you get it all. Okay, we got him to start moving. And I like walking these capacitors out that have leaked like this because uh, you can't often desolder them successfully in the first shot. And it's just easier and safer to heat the legs and walk them out like that. And if we look at the other side of the board, let me get you a close up there. Uh, okay. Yep. See, there's another via here that was affected. These traces here. That's why I try to make notes before I take caps off because often you wind up scraping away some of the silk screen to get to the damaged bits. And you've got to get all this corrosion off or it'll just come back in short order and be a real pain in the butt. Looks like we've got a break there, break there, maybe a break right at that via. These two legs of this diode and resistor there. And clean all that up. So I'll get this cleaned up and then show you where we're at. I've spent about 20 minutes cleaning up around this one linking capacitor. Uh, the capacitor was here. And you can see all the way over here, there's a break in the trace. And uh, the rest of these traces are okay. This via right here toward the top of these two pins. If we look at the other side of the board, uh, that's that guy right there. He's completely eaten away. And so there's a break there. There's a break there. Uh, that V is eaten away there, which comes over to here. Um, so this is going to require some bodge wires after I figure out where all these different leads go. Um... It definitely could have been worse, but there's all, you know, some finely pitched traces right here. So I'm going to figure out the best way to fix this. I don't know if I'm going to drill and try to press in new vias, uh, if that'll be the best option for this board or not. We will see. Well, just like that, and two hours goes by. Let's see if I can get you zoomed in here. So... This is probably the worst area of it. Um, you can see the capacitors were here and here. And it really did a number in here. I had to take the sensor loose. Um, the other area was right up here. The capacitor sitting right there. It ate through several traces there. 
if we look at the back of the board, let's see, we wound up with one, two, three, four bodge wires uh, reconnecting traces. Some traces broken on this side too. Yeah, so quite the ordeal. Um, anyhow, so what I want to do now is use some of this uh, overcoating pin to go over the areas that I can before I put the capacitors back in. And uh, then once this is dry, put the capacitors in and hopefully I've got all the bodge wires in the right place and uh, it'll work. And then we can pull the uh, motor control or motor drive board out and take a look at that. Okay. So. Okay, so give that a few hours to cure and see if it works. Well, let's see what we can do on this motor board. A friend of mine recently speculated that a lot of this Japanese electronics might have JIS screws instead of standard Phillips. So I bought this small JIS set. Well, that sure fit. He likes working on old Honda motorcycles and in that application you know after 30 years of a screw being in there it doesn't want to come out and use a regular Phillips screwdriver and you've just destroyed the screw so. there we go oh yeah big old magnet We've got the coils right here and four screws to hold that down. Now, you see this pattern around here? It's kind of interesting. There's two leads coming off of it. I wonder if that's some sort of sensor. And... goes under there and we have some short wires let's say LED that look like they shine through a hole we've got one two three four five six seven capacitors well, and yeah, I see some discoloration around these guys. They look a little wet, so these guys are leaking. So, um, plan of attack. Well, I think I'll desolder these two LED leads. And this is a single-sided board, so there's no traces on the front side. Thankfully. Um, and they, uh, they don't look too bad on the back side. So I'll desolder these two LEDs, remove the capacitors, and replace them uh, just like we did with the others. Same idea here. I'll trace the circuit board. And for a larger board, I'll just draw a rough outline, but these are small enough to trace it. got capacitor here and here and here and here 
and here, and here. This is C15. This is positive. C3, positive. Okay, C4 is... 33 microfarad, 25 volt. 33 microfarad, 25 volt. Better get the old man glasses. C6 is 0.47 microfarad, 50 volts. These all look polarized. Yes. I thought Ray Carlson said something in his write-up about some of the caps being unpolarized, but I don't see that on this drive. There's this funny cap here. It's not leaking. I think it's some sort of polyester. It looks fine, so I'm not going to touch it. The rest of these are just regular electrolytics. Okay, so now I will double check the values against my list and remove these and replace them. You guys have seen me do that before. Now that the top coating we put on the drive control board has had time to cure, we'll go ahead and solder in new capacitors. And then I'm going to temporarily tape down the bodge wires and use some E6000 glue to tack them into place. Before installing the circuit board back on the drive, I do want to take the opportunity to do a little cleaning and lubricating. I don't need to lubricate the head cable though. So I've just got a little lithium grease here. And I'm going to rub just the smallest amount possible on the rails. See that blob there? That's way too much. So. These drives have a single head, which is on the bottom. There we go. All right, so we should be good there. And there was a little insulator sheet there, which I stuck back down to. I've got our two connectors here. They were smart and made these different sizes, so there's no confusion. They're also polarized, so you can't get them backwards. This is jumper DS0, which should be drive zero. There's supposed to be, I was reading the directions. There's supposed to be a jumper block for setting that to drive eight. To get this rotated around so I can read the writing. Now we're going to have to assemble this whole thing back together, just like we took it apart. And see if it works. Okay, so that board should sit in there like that. And this one had machine screws and star washers, as I recall. So maybe we can just lay him over like that. It's a pretty robust design, I guess. The only complaint is it might be a little difficult to work on sprawled out on the bench. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's definitely a different chassis for the dual drive version. 
and the way the dual drives are set up is kind of interesting. Uh, they're set up kind of like on the, the PET uh, dual drives and for the B-series business machines where you had a drive zero and a drive one at the same drive number. They're set up like that, but you could configure them to act as like eight, nine or whatever if you're used to Mona 64 or Vic 20. But the IEEE 48 plug was for like a 2000, 3000 series business machine rather than the pet. This, where was our power plug for the machine? Went down here. Okay. Yeah, you see a little frame ground in here now. Come on. Snap in there. There we go. And pin one goes up. I marked that. Power can only go one direction. This drive is a TEC-501 Tokyo Electric Company Limited, made in Japan. Now I read somewhere online that they modified this drive to work. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not sure why they would have needed to. Well, you know what? I think the machine screws I put in the board are actually for the drive. Yeah, I can see the, well, I don't know. The drive is definitely machine screws. Oh, yep, yeah, that would have been the case. And then all the rest of the case screws were the same. Okay, well, the machine screw to where a sheet metal screw should go isn't going to mess anything up because they're about the same diameter. The other way around, that wouldn't have been good. Put the sheet metal screw into the machine screw hole. Well, we can see our wheel there. And remember, we had these two screws in here. And I guess they also sold a uh, IEEE 48 adapter for the C64 slash VIC-20. Okay, that is installed, those are together, and then we have six case screws left over. Okay, no extra parts. That looks good. Now luckily, the speed wheel is out here, and I went out to the garage and got my little fluorescent lamp so we can check the speed. Just need, need to see if this thing operates uh, like it should, and then go from there. So I'll get everything hooked up to test it. Okay, before connecting this to the uh, computer, I thought it would be prudent to check voltages. I wasn't sure which direction on the switch is which. So, uh, I left the switch in the down position, and of course that's on. Uh, we've got a green power light and a red drive light. So it sounds like the head's cycling. And if we go to, if we get the leads untangled, uh, go to a ground here and output of the 12 volt regulator, we have 12.2. Output of the 5 volt regulator, we have 4.9. Okay, so our voltages are okay. Now we can get the computer set up and see if we can make the drive do something. Okay, I've got you pointed at the screen and I'm going to turn the drive on. The head does jog back and forth. Uh, just like before, we got a green power LED, the red LED on solid on the drive. And I think that's okay according to the manual. Um, as I recall, it said as long as it wasn't flashing. Now I will turn on the Commodore. 
And the drive jogged again. That seems like a good sign. It must be saying the computer or it saw the reset. I've got a disc here that I marked uh, front bed back okay. I think this is the one I was using when we were checking the um, temperature of the drive when we did the uh, switching regulator upgrade. So that means we would want this side like this. Basically the label to the left. Oh, that is super, super blurry. Here, we'll try that again. Okay. This may have something uh, on it. I don't know. Okay. The drive's doing something. Hey, look at that. <laughs> it's got a directory on there. Oh, that's right. We're copying Junkman. This is a copy off my original disc as a kid with all my original high scores and everything on it. How cool is that? Okay, so now this is not the original disc, mind you. This is a copy of it. Okay. I wonder if I can get a better angle for you than that. We'll try this. Um, you can't see the screen as well, but you can see the drive and me and I've got the uh, uh, PC on behind me so I can see the manual. Now we'll try formatting this disc. That's a pretty good test that it's both reading and writing and everything. And of course, we can't use the fast load cart. Uh, you can get Jiffy DOS for this though. So I'll have to do open, oh, open 15 comma 8 comma 15. Comma, disk ID of 42. Comma, so 15815 in the zero for new um, name ID. Syntax error. Ah, I forgot a, forgot a comma. Now let's try that. And we have a red and green flashing LED. So let me look that up in the manual. I'll be right back with you. A little more handheld shaky cam here. Uh, I've had this board off of here about three more times. Uh, I found s some schematics, the ones from Ray, and also found out that the uh, TRS-80 Model 100 uh, DVI disk video interface uses the same drive. The service manual for that had a um, layout of the board. The quality of the scan wasn't great, but it was good enough that I could check all the the lines into these two chips for the worst of the corrosion was. That was fine. I did find I had missed one uh, broken trace under this chip, which I fixed. It still wasn't working. So I checked everything again and again, and I found this capacitor here, which is C14. You notice how the stripe is pointing that way? I hit it that way. Well, this area was so obliterated under here. There's actually four pads. I think I mentioned this earlier. And uh, the pad that was over here to the right, which I originally had the negative terminal in, um, actually runs down this way, and it is part of the right control circuitry. So that's why we couldn't write to the disk. So I rotated this guy around, checked everything for about the 14th time, and now it is formatting disk. I can load and save and all that kind of stuff. Woohoo. So, then kind of a challenge. Uh, these boards can really get eaten up because of leaks. 
I think also just having it run and spin around and spin the spindle bearings and everything has helped a lot too. And we'll set the uh, drive speed next. I'll show you how to do that. And uh, then I'm going to go ahead and mount our drive back in the case, which is right here. You can just uh, get the cord out here with the drive like this. You can sort of work on it on the bench. This shot is kind of dark because I will show you how I set the drive speed. Got an old fashioned fluorescent lamp here. Uh, you can't use an LED light. The bulbs in these flicker at your main frequency. Uh, so we want to watch this outside ring when this is running and the speed set right. It'll look like these black blocks are standing still. There's a screw adjustment right there. I'm not going to try to film and tweak that at the same time. So I'm just going to tell it to format this disc. If we watch that outside ring, those pretty much look like they're standing still. They might be going counterclockwise ever so slightly. There we go. We just formatted the disc and our drive speed is set correctly. Woohoo! Okay, we'll try this again to get everything in the shot. Can't see anything well, but you can see everything really poorly. Oh, uh, just started the system up. I'll pop this disc in the drive. Uh, we formatted it on this drive. Remember, it originally read, right after I got done recapping, it read a disc that I had formatted on another 1541. So, um, given this isn't one of the original uh, head knocking mechanisms used, used by Commodore, I'm not worried about the alignment on this guy. Um, so, we can load the directory. I have saved a file in here. Ah, there's our test program. Load. Test. And this program just reads the error channel on the drive. I was using it uh, when testing. I would type in the line to format the drive and then it gave me an error. I would just run and it would tell me the error. So, right now, the drive's working fine. No errors. It says no errors. So, uh, what did we learn? Well, uh, it's an interesting little disk drive. It's built very solidly. Uh, the the board itself, the MSD made, that's fine. You know, the capacitors on there weren't leaking, had some high ESR. That was easy to take care of. Uh, the TEC disk drive, though, that was another story. All the electrolytics on the, the motor drive board as well as the control board were all leaking. On the motor board, it didn't do any damage. Uh, on the control board, it was a mess. And that led to me accidentally putting the one capacitor C14, I think it was, in 90 degrees, which doesn't seem possible, but I'll pop it up here on the screen. Uh, there's actually two vias right beside that cap with the exact same spacing. And that was so eaten up in there, I couldn't tell. I went back and looked at race pictures. I looked at... The, that diagram that I found in the TRS-80 DVI manual that had the, the board trace layout and that made it obvious what I did so I redid that and then it formatted and everything was okie dokie. So uh, I also played around some some of the standard diagnostics uh, programs uh, that you'd use for 1541. Of course they don't work on here because the firmware is different. Uh, this did come with some of its own utilities, which Ray had up on a site. I haven't tried those yet. Um, I would guess that those kind of give you some of the same capabilities. There was not a real good description, though, so I don't know. Um, and like I said, I'm not too worried about the alignment on this guy unless it's been knocked around or damaged or, or something like that, because it's not a head knocker. Anyhow, we've got a drive fixed up. We've got some non-leaking caps in there. And it was quite an adventure. This is one of those I had to stop last night and um, think about something else, do something else, and then did a little more research and was ready to start this morning with you know a clear head. And it only took about an hour this morning to, to get it sorted out, luckily. 
So uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, leave them in that comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone who helps support the Hate Burt channel through Patreon and other means. It is greatly appreciated. And until next time, bye.